most people's ego will not allow them to do that. So they will just do nothing. And what we're finding out right now, our client's biggest issue in a sale is not the competition. It is people doing nothing. So instead of some competitor coming and taking the business, indecision is the number one competitor that we're seeing our clients face all the time. People just aren't willing to make a decision. Hello, thank you for joining us on the Evolve Your Brand podcast. I am your host, Ali Amerkis, and I just want to give a huge shout out and thank you to Icon Industries, Shane times three. I don't know why you did that, but there should only be one, Shane. Our chief nerd, Stephen, appreciate you, brother, immensely, and the rest of the team here. Couldn't be as uh, fantastic of a show without you guys, so appreciate everything that you do. And without further ado, I'm so very excited. We have G.A. Bartek. Mm -hmm. um, let me go. Do you want me to go list every single? Please do not. No, no, no. I can. <laughs> like, we can hype you up. So I think what I appreciate about you, G.A., is like who you see and who you get is the same person. So I think that's the biggest compliment I can well, give you. you like, I appreciate that. Just I, I appreciate your energy, your attitude, your enthusiasm. You're an author, a coach. Uh, you love pickleball. You love pickleball. So we can start with that. Let's yes. just jump into it and, okay. and have some fun. Let's do it. A bit, what makes a pickleball aficionado? That's what my question is. So, A, you know, I, I played sports my entire life. Okay. Pickleball, it is super competitive. Right. But it's, it's the only game I've ever played where men and women have, men have no advantage over women. Okay. It's not a power game. Right. It's a strategy game. And a lot has to do, so it's physical strategy. I mean, you don't get a lot of games like that. And again, I can, women, men and women are pretty equal. And it's just a ton of fun. Game's 12, 15 minutes. We laugh the entire time. But what I really like the best about it, if you're a jerk, they don't invite you back. So it's only good people they continue to play with. If people don't like them, like, dude, that guy's not coming back. And they kick him out. You said my favorite thing. I'm like, all right. So you can basically use it as a tool to weed people out of your life, apparently. Exactly. And and, <laughs> and, and if, if you show up consistently late, you bitch about line calls, you you hedge your bets on some of your line calls, and you're not fun to play with, you're not coming back. <laughs> Do you use pickleball as an analogy for sales, by the way? A great question. And I haven't yet. Ooh. Obviously, my next keynote, my next book may have some pickleball references in it. I think you should bring that in. It That's was like good. a microcosm for life right now. It's like, hmm, Very much so. interesting, fascinating. It Pickleball has really, I mean, holy pickleball. moly. You know Tristan Ayumata? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> He's like, <clears throat> when something is hot, like you absolutely jump all over it. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about pickleball and I'm like, okay. He's like, go all out, start tournaments and stuff like that. <laughs> It is, it is like wildfire. I'm shocked. It, 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 yeah. I mean, I play three, four times a week. Really? The tournaments. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's my passion right now. Oh, get it. Oh, you weren't kidding yeah. when you put no, that on your profile. No, no. And it, I mean, I've stopped playing golf. You know, golf's five hours. It's a good walk. Oh, ruined. okay. You can go play two hours, get a great workout in, have some fun. Okay, I'm I'm uh, I'm gonna have to. I, I haven't partaken we'll, in a pickleball we'll game, so we're gonna have to work on this. I'm I'm in. I want to see if I get invited back. That'll be my that, test. That, yes. Do you know what's is, funny? If I don't yes. get invited back, I'll be like GA. I don't. What did I do, man? Like I'm, I'm so exactly. exactly. Um, I I love having uh, individuals on that have been on podcast before. You know, uh, what what are your thoughts about podcasting? I think it's an amazing medium to really get down to the essence of who people are mm. and what they do and to learn some great content. So I think it's a great opportunity that's not super commercial. They can get down. And again, I'm all about the essence of people. And when I, you know, I'm, I'm a sales guy, but it's all about how do you put the heart back in sales? Mm. And that's what, you know, podcast is putting the heart back in communication. How come you think heart, the heart needs to be back in sales? Oh, wow. So I think, you know, early 2000s, companies wanted everything to go automatic. 
So they they put everything online. You got the whole people element out of there. And I think the pendulum swung way left on that. And I think it really degraded the client experience. And so you know, my book, Six Critical Steps to Open Up More Relationships and Closing More Sales. Closing More Sales is the byproduct of opening up a relationship. And that's really what I think, they think it's all about. It's about it, creating relationships, creating connections. And I think that's been lost in a lot of sales. You know, we, we, get, we get brought in a lot of times after other consultants, other sales companies have gone in and they really try to make sales. And there's two parts to sales. One part process, one part personality. Right. You have to put the right process in place that allows people to put their personality into it. We call it freedom within the framework. Here's your process. Here's your framework. Now stay within the guardrails of that framework because it works. It's successful. But a lot of organizations, a lot of companies want to create a bunch of little robots with a script. And we didn't know that just doesn't work because it takes away the human element. And I think people today, especially post-COVID, are, are yearning for that personal relationship. And I think everybody thinks that their situation is totally different and unique. So a big part of, of discovering the sales process is not discovery for me and me trying to figure out whether this person is qualified or not. A big part of discovery is for the prospect, for them oftentimes to create their own buying gap in their own mind, where they are currently, where they want to go. And then can your product or service bridge that gap? And so really taking a genuine interest in the other person is I think the key to all success when it comes to relationships, which then bleeds over to sales. Um. Uh, you gave me so much. Let me go. Let me go one by one. How come you think that in the two thousands companies got away from the personality? Uh, all yeah, money related. Okay. If I can, I can offshore stuff. I yeah. can, I can push people to do their own on the web, trying to FAQs. It was all about just getting rid of the, the just putting people online, getting rid of the human element, and that'll be easier, quicker, faster, cheaper. Money over people. 100%. And okay. over, over experience, over that customer experience. That's, uh, and how do you how do you feel about that? I think it's, you know, I'm glad to see the pendulum is coming back a little bit. Some companies are realizing that's not quite the way, the customer experience we want to create. But it's, it's not easy. There's still a lot of people out there that, you know, publicly traded companies we work with a lot. You know, are they working on the customer experience? Or are they working on creating value for their shareholders? Shareholder value and client experience oftentimes are mm. confrontational. And so what we've been able to do is how do you get a great customer experience? If you do it right, then it takes care of all kinds of other metrics the right way. So you still create that shareholder value, but you're creating the right culture, the right fit, but more importantly, the right customer experience before they purchase, during the purchase, and after the purchase. Uh, GA, how many, how many, I, and I feel like if I called you a sales coach, it's like I'm throwing a negative at you. <laughs> uh, and, and I actually love being a sales professional because I'm a professional oh. in my craft. You know what I mean? There's nothing wrong with sales. It's the, the meaning that sales has to people now is yeah. because it is, it's a, it, it's, it's all about margins mm -hmm. versus experience. Yes. Easiest way I, I can define yeah. it. And so what I what I value as a sales professional is you talk about problem finder. I, I love to find the problem finder plus problem solver, which is add the both two together and help that person get to their ultimate goal as quickly as possible and as efficiently possible based on their spot goals. Spot on. Yeah, spot on. And the biggest issue that people have so again, they're not willing to spend the time and the energy, the effort to genuinely understand and know about this person. And then it comes to great current situation, desired situation, where they at, where they want to go. And can I, I think the best compliment is when people sit there and say, oh my gosh, GA, you get us. And that's really what we try to do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it's never about me. No. It's never about me. No. It's never about me. Once that's, I learned that, I'm that's, like. The, if, if you're paying attention, that right there is solid gold. It's not about you. It's about understanding the other person and being able to help them reach their goals. 
sometimes it's goals they didn't even know they had, that through good discovery, you're able to unlock those. So again, it's about them creating that buying gap in their own mind. Again, the buying gap, where they are currently, where they want to go, in between that area right there is that buying gap. And my job, if I do it well, is to create that buying gap in their own mind. So they sit there and say, oh my God, I didn't realize I need that. Thank you so much, GA. So therefore, it's no longer selling. Right. It's then, it's about helping people get to where they want to go. And it's a totally different experience. And old school sales, and this is what we get told all the time, hey, GA, you guys are bringing concilio, you guys are bringing new school sales into our organization. Old school sales, and again, I've read every sales book out there, you know, Gitter, Brian Tracy, Zig Ziglar, all the greats. And a lot of them still teach. It's all about finding the pain point. Challenge your model, find their pain point, rub some salt. If there's, there's no pain, they'll move. What we find today and doing a lot of research on this is that pain causes paralysis and excitement causes movement. Let me explain what I mean by that. Pain causes paralysis. Right now, if you're, t- let's say you're, you're talking to, a chief marketing officer and you're a marketing company and there's most likely the the company they're using right now to market for them. You're talking to chief marketing officer. He chose that company. He's not going to be willing to admit that he made a, made a mistake. He's going to have to go to his president and say, Hey president, I'm going to change marketing companies because the one I brought in isn't working. Most people's ego will not allow them to do that. So they will just do nothing. And what we're finding out right now, our client's biggest issue in a sale is not the competition. It is people doing nothing. So instead of some competitor coming and taking the business, indecision is the number one competitor that we're seeing our clients face all the time. People just aren't willing to make a decision. New school sales, again, it's not about their pain point. Pain causes paralysis, excitement causes movement. If I can help them clearly visualize what success looks like, and then how my product or service can help them reach that success. That's when I know we got a relationship going. When did you, uh, you seem kind of a maverick in your, in your space. When did you come to this epiphany that what you just got the biggest smirk on? Yeah. Well, I just, I never, been, I never, never been called a maverick. Well, love I, that. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm a maverick in my space. Uh, totally. The moment I, I started, every single person said, you're doing, you're doing lending the wrong way. Mm-hmm. This is how we do it. Awesome. That's how you do it. It's not how I do it. Like, I just think it does take, uh, it just never made sense to me. I, I'm one of those people that's so fucking hard headed that I can be told something. I'm just until I'm skeptical until I get my answers. Cause I love to understand why and what I have never, you're, you're, you have experience in the real estate space mm-hmm. and maybe you can answer this question for me. How come? How come real estate is so fucking transactional versus experience and relationship based with such a powerful impact that we can make on people's lives? I don't get it. Well, first off, again, a mortgage, 99% of the time, it's that person's largest investment they're ever going to make. And so, again, making it transactional because they only do it every so often. They're not buying a new house every year, even though a lot of people do. It becomes very transactional where I want to, A, save as much money as possible. And you have a lot of discount lenders out there plugging the airways. And a you know, a great if you have a great mortgage guy, great mortgage girl, that's that's gold. But most people aren't willing to, as a salesperson, take the time and energy and effort to learn about again where they've been when it comes to home ownership, where they are right now, where do they want to go with this home. What are their expectations of a lender? Being able to, again, do that deep, holistic discovery. But the most, most most lenders aren't willing to do that. So it becomes transactional. And because when the market's hot, there's so many leads, I'm just going to cherry pick and go as fast as I can to qualify this one. If they're not qualified, I'll move on to the next. And I'm like, people, sit down, take some time. And I can guarantee you we can double your business by inclo- increasing your close rate by doing the proper process and building the relationship versus the transaction. GA, I didn't even know you existed <laughs> like a month ago. I'm so glad that you do. Like, yeah, seriously, man. I love it. Love um, it. Uh, what, what, I, I'm so excited to read your book. Uh, what I am very excited about is this, that 
you're 100% right. I, you know, especially I think when I'm buying something at Amazon mm -hmm. and I'm trying to figure out the home that's going to create all my family's memories, I'm not using the same buying process Great for point. these things. Great point. I'm not. No. Because if I go discount, like I understand getting a discount. Hey, I want to save 10 bucks. Yeah, a hundred. Because sometimes, GA, when I run the math, when I run the math, we're talking about a hundred dollar difference per month. Yeah. And it's like someone that can create well over a hundred dollars a month for me. I value them immensely because they can teach me the cost yeah. of money and how to get to my goals quicker. Yeah. And a, a good mortgage guy, or gal, pardon me, their job is really education. If they really see how their job is, I'm here, I'm here to educate my borrower to help them make the right buying decision. That's that's the essence of the whole thing. That's it. Um, do you, Are you on social media? I am. You are. Not as much as I should be. That's okay. No, right. no, no. That's a great yes. thing. Don't yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go down the rabbit hole. Um, so- when you see, I'm, I'm going to say something. I just want to see what your reaction. It's always a great time to buy. 100%. I have my wife's best friend. Okay. We bought our first house in Rancho Penasquitos. We bought it for okay. 250 And her best friend could not make a decision. Ended up a year and a half later buying a condo for 320 Right. We bought it. And so I've just seen that. That was the, a big aha moment for me of, hey, it's right now. Is, is our homes getting any cheaper? I don't think so. No. So my wife and I, we're second homeless right now. Right. And so we were just spent this last weekend out in Delaware looking at homes. And nice. And people are like, well, gee, the interest rate's really high. Well, yes, but there's always an, an, an adverse reaction to that too. And prices are, are, are being somewhat kept down also right now too. So is now is always a good time to buy if you can find the right property and can get into it. Absolutely. Because it's not going to get any less expensive. And that I agree with. It's definitely not going to get get any less expensive. What if I have massive debt? I don't know how to manage my finances, but I can afford to buy a house. Should I buy a house? I would think 100%. Absolutely. Okay. I mean- Even if I couldn't afford the payment? You got to work with a good bro broker and make sure you got the right payment. There you go. See, that's and, and that's, that, that's, I will give you my opinion. I don't actually think it's a great time to buy because it's, it's individualized, right? Yeah, it should I be based that. on- it should be based on the family's financial circumstances. Yeah. And for me, that that's why, like to me, throwing that stuff out there, that's what that that's what creates gotcha. that sales reputation. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, hey guys, like if if interest rates don't matter, I hear this all the time in my space, okay? Interest rates don't matter. Interest rates uh, 20 years ago were 17%. Yep. I'm sorry, but home prices weren't where they're at exactly. today. Exactly. Okay. So it's not always a great time to buy if you don't know how to manage your finances in California because you could lose your house. Like that's when you're talking yeah. about Good that. Point. Good point. It's like the way I look at it is if interest rates don't matter if they're high, then how come all of us create content that says interest rates went down when they go down? If interest yeah. rates don't matter, like we contradict That's ourselves. Hundred percent, you're right. You're absolutely right in that. But you know the the question that you posed me is a good time. Is always a good time to buy, right? If you can afford it, and you, absolutely. If you can't, then you better work with somebody who can help you get the tools and skills that you need so you can manage your money correctly. So then, my friend, you're put in the right position. But you know. And I knew that's exactly what yeah. you meant because yeah. you're that guy. It's like you you talked about this on the Fun Loans podcast. Yes. It was really, really good, by the way. They did Thank a you. great job. You said it's like uh, if the decision, uh, you have to be able to articulate your thoughts and that takes practice. Yes. Tell that me. was incredible. Yeah. So that's, I mean, as a salesperson, your number one skill is communication. Yes. And But what most people buy a thousandfold underestimate the time, the energy, and the repetition it takes to become a great communicator. So if you go to a, a, a training, which we all have done, you walk with what we call verbal knowledge. The facilitator delivers a beautiful credibility statement. Like, ooh, that sounds great. Like, ooh, I got that. And in your mind, you got it. So that's what I call verbal knowledge. That's knowing what to say. But I don't know about you, but sometimes how to go from verbal knowledge to verbal skill. Cause sometimes with what I say in my mind is beautiful. Like as I was driving over here, kind of preparing for this, I was kind of rehearsing my kind of introduction and stuff. And in my mind, again, I spoke every word slowly and clearly. Everybody, y'all laughed at the right time. 
but something happens with what I say in my mind or what comes out of my mouth are sometimes two totally different things. So how do you move from verbal knowledge, knowing what to say to verbal skill, being able to actually say it out loud to finally verbal mastery, to be able to say the right thing at the right time under pressure, in those critical moments when you're in front of a high value prospect or customer. And it just takes repetition and being able to, it again, it's not a script, but it's about knowing the process. And if you have the right process in place, it makes it so much easier because it takes all the mental gymnastics out of the sales process. I mean, think right. about when you're talking to a prospect, all the mental gymnastics, okay, are they picking up what I'm putting down? What am I going to say next? Where do I need to go? Holy crap, I need to pick up some groceries on the way home too. All that stuff going through your mind and it takes you away from being fully focused. You have the right process in place. You know where you're at and where you want to go. So it's just having a conversation and I can focus on my prospect versus what I'm doing, where I'm going on those mental gymnastics. So for me, having the right process in place allows me to quiet my mind and then be able to create that genuine connection with my prospect. I get you. Getting a little teary out there, are you? I'm, I'm, uh, this, is, this is what I, I believe being a this true, this sales been, been professional. Been do, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, it can be done this way. And look at the success you've achieved. Mm -hmm. You've wrote a book. And um, a lot of, so a lot of the sales people I follow, like you have, you have Grant Cardone, you mm -hmm. have Andy Elliott, you have uh, Jeremy Miner. Yep. Oh, yeah. Who do, you, who do you like that, that you think is putting the right message out for how sales should be based on what GA believes? Besides yourself. Yeah. And it's, you know what? <laughs> Did you like it? I, I appreciate I brought you right that. back into because it. Because yeah. I have actually stopped looking at and see what else people are putting out there. Nice. And so, and it's a true story. Uh, Grant does a lot of really, really fun, great stuff. Does he really teach people how to actually communicate and sell? I got a little bit, a little bit of an issue on that. So, right. but what I found out is, is that if I spend a lot of time diving into what other people are doing, it starts to affect, and my, my, and I start unfortunately doubting myself. Ooh, they're doing a little bit differently. Okay, is my way the right way or not? Maybe the way is a little bit better. Maybe I should try it their way. But that takes me away from my true belief system. Nice. And so that's why I really stopped, you know, looking at and observing and and taking in other people's content. Amazing. And what what's wh how come you think the approach that you have towards becoming a people-driven sales professional, how come you think it's the right path for someone to go? Well, let me just back up and give you a little history on GA Bartek. Let's grow. So started my sales career at Nordstrom. Yes. And I got to admit, I wasn't very good in sales. I was actually put on a PIP. You know what a PIP is? Yeah. Performance PIP's Improvement Plan. Okay. And they don't put you on there because you're crushing it. <laughs> That's usually step two of one, two barbecue. <laughs> or step dose of uno, dos, adios. Did you adios? Well- Luckily, I was on I was on a pip. Obviously, you've been there too, with, with your knowledge of pips. No, so I was on a pip, so I couldn't sell. But I really want to get into management. So I spent like three weeks busting my ass. I got a, I got myself off my pip, which got me eligible for management. Then I spent the next eleven years as a manager at Nordstrom, and it was a great experience. I really learned how to create the customer experience and what that was. That's at that time, Nordstrom was known for that client and customer experience. And so, but I left Nordstrom to make my billions in real estate. And, you know, live here in San Diego. I figure if I'm going to sell real estate, let's go to someplace expensive. I got up to Del Mar, got my real estate license, started selling real estate. I was there 11 months, busting my ass, coming in early, staying late. And it was the last day of the month. And my boss says, hey, Gia, you got a quick second for me? And I pop into his office and he says, you know what, Gia? I love your enthusiasm. I love your work ethic. But I look at the sales results. He only sold one house in the last 11 months. I'm going to start just not working out and turn around and hand me a cardboard box. So I'm like, no worries. I got a job selling eyewear. I thought this will be fantastic. I'll be talking to ophthalmologists, opticians, optometrists. They will buy from me. I do have the gift of gab. And those are my initials and only my obvious good looks. Oh, I mean, no doubt. No I doubt. Mean, so I'm there. You didn't need to yeah, point that out, by bucks. the way. I'm so. there eight months, coming in early, staying late. It's the last day of the month. And my boss is GA. It's about 545. Before you take off, you got a quick second for me. And I pop into his office and he goes, you know what, GA? God, I love your enthusiasm. Love your work ethic. You come in early, you stay in late. But I've been looking at the sales results. And I'm sorry, it's just not working out. And he handed me another cardboard box. So 
I then lost a third job in sales because I couldn't sell. And I was reading every book out there and all these books had tips and tricks. And so at 29 years old, I got a paper route. This was before Lyft and Uber. I had to make $400 a month for rent. So I made $100 a week. My wife's a school teacher. I'd wake up in PQ, go up to Escondido, throw 137 Wall Street journals, get back home around 6, 6.15. My wife would hand us our new baby daughter, Alicia. She'd go off to be a school teacher. I'd take Alicia over to grandma's house. Then I'd go up to Encinitas to be a mortgage broker. But again, I was a broke broker. Why? Because I had no process. And so I did, I got a referral to a person, to a gentleman buying a house for $1.4 million. I was like, oh my God, this is 30 years ago. How I, how's this person affording a house for 1.4 million? He was a salesperson for AT&T. And so for the 45 day escrow, I really picked his brain on sales and what he was doing. Then he gave me another, another lead to another A&T salesperson buying a house in Del Mar for 1.2 million. And I did his mortgage. And so I'm like, and he was in sales too. Like these guys are crushing it by million dollar houses and I'm failing measure with a paper out. What are they doing differently? And so I was able to observe both of them and notice they kind of had a little process that they weren't even aware of. And so I started doing more and more interviewing. I brought my brother in, Paul, who's a researcher. Uh, and we did about 6,000 interviews, 33,000 pages of notes. That's how we ended up writing the book. But it was originally called No Silver Bullet to Sales. And I, so I thought there was no magical phrase that if you do a shitty job of pre-call planning, you don't build very much rapport. Your discovery sucks. Your solution is not tailored at all. Your address concerns very confrontationally. There is no magical phrase that if I say this little magical phrase, the heavens will part. You'll hear that little, little heavenly music sounds like, and you'll change your mind. That's what every book out there was kind of teaching me. And so I realized there was something different. That's when I, we ended up writing the book where I kind of kicked off my consulting career and by the way, if I can do a, 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 a unshameful plug, non-shameful plug. No, there's no shame in it. Okay, good. If so, you don't plug you, then yes. no one else will. So we got a book coming out in uh, probably February, maybe March. Our publisher is still trying to work on that right now called Core Leadership. And it really takes our, takes our sales heart and puts it into leadership. And it's about all about mindset, skill set, executions, and relationships. Yeah. So that's the kind of the core four elements that we have coming out. How come there's, I, I, I love, I love the book. Uh, I think <clears throat> um, I'm going to throw you for a curveball in a Go minute. Go for it. Bring it on. I, I, I'm going to. GA. Bring it on, my friend. Gee, I love the initials, by the way. <laughs> yes. Gift them. Um, how come uh, the second book? Like what, what, what was the driving factor for writing the uh, second book? Interesting. You really want to go deep on this, my friend. I want to go as deep as you want to go. Probably 2015, I said, screw it. I don't want to deal with all these people. You had 30 plus people in the company and it almost killed me. I was traveling every single week and I said, I want to simplify my life and had an opportunity to become a solopreneur. I can make a great living just doing my own thing, keynotes, training, not even have to deal with all these other people because we were traveling all over the world and I would freak out, you know, did they show up on time? Did the materials all get there? And it was, it was seriously not good for me. I was almost dying. I was just working too hard. And my son said at the time at a big fancy house, the big fancy car, my son said, dad, can we move closer to the high school? I'm like, son, why would you want to do that? He goes, because dad, I mean, I want to be around my friends. We're too far out here. I don't have enough friends close by. I'm like, well, Jack, look at this house. Look at all we have here. Why don't you want to get rid of this? And he goes, Dad, it's just a house. And I realized when he said it's just a house that I spent probably 30 years of my life trying to prove to my father I made it. It's a whole other podcast. We won't go into that whole session. But uh, so I just want to simplify my life. So we sold the big house and we have a nice little house we really enjoy. But I also decided I don't want to run the company anymore. That if I'm facilitating coaching, where I love to be in front of the room, one-on-one -on -one coaching, facilitating, being in the executive meetings. That's where I want to be. I can't run this company and do the same thing. In my 30s and 40s, it was easier to be out all day long, you know, working with a client, going out to a really nice dinner, getting back to my hotel room and running my company from, you know, 1130 at night till 2 a.m. So I hired Stacey McKibben and it was the best thing I've ever done in my career. She's now the CEO of Concilio and... 
we've been talking about, I've been thinking about this book percolating on it. And she really was a driver says, Hey, we got to get this book out. So it's, so I'm co-authored with Stacy and hopefully Forbes will have it out here shortly. And yes, you will definitely have you come back because uh, GA, I've been looking for, you know, one of the things that has become a passion on the podcast, I didn't realize it was, I really want to go find amazing people doing amazing things in the community and become the champion in advocacy for mm. people that do it the right way. I don't look at any other mortgage advisor. I've had other mortgage advisors on here that work at different brokerages. Yep. I don't give a shit. Like, what do I care? Like, if there's more of people that are taking oh, yeah. care of more that. people, yeah. I'll champion them. Yeah. Heck yeah. Maybe we need more of that. Like you're not competition. You're going to make me better. Like two at and sales guys. <laughs> like it is the coolest story. Yeah. Two at and sales guys. I'm helping with their mortgages. I'm like, what are you guys doing? I wrote a book. Yeah. Like literally that, that's what you did. I mean, look at the power of impact. Yeah. Yep. Insane. Do you, do you talk to those guys? <laughs> it's, 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 it, it actually, it's a, it, I haven't. Okay. And so it's probably about a year and a half ago. I was just going back and trying to go back to past clients. Right. I've been doing this for 20 years now, a little yeah. 20 years. And so there's a lot of clients I've worked with 15 years ago. I'm not working with today. I'm like, why don't I? And talk about vulnerability. I realized, you know, why I wasn't calling them to work with them. Yeah. Cause I was, cause I was afraid. What if I call them up and they don't want to work with me? Um, they don't really, I don't have a relationship that I really thought I had. Yeah. So it took me, it took Stacy and me to really spend some couch time to really figure out, you know, what am I afraid of? And so I started going on this truck and calling all my own clients just to build the relationship back up. Nice. To do business with us. Great. That's, but that was not the reason to reach out to them. And so, but I done a little bit of research on trying to find Tom Norris, but as I'm, I'm now tracking down, but it's something after this podcast that I need to do. Cause yes, they, they set me on a path. That changed my life. Oh, and I'd luckily, you, if yeah. you connect with them and, yeah. and depending on what cool thing they were doing, how cool yeah. a podcast yeah. would that be? That'd be amazing. Yeah. Like, You're seriously, man, yeah. those are like, yeah. that was, uh, have you le read the third? Oh my goodness. I think I'm going to mess up the name on this. It's the third door. And it was talking about like, uh, this guy <laughs> went and interviewed, like he was just hit up billionaires. I'm going to send you the name of the book. He would hit up billionaires and it's like this one moment where they opened up, like there's this one door, there's two door. And then there's that third door yeah, they, that opens everything up. That was your steps. third door, man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. That's such yeah. a cool story. Yeah. You know, that's, um, that's, 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 how I, that's how I got to where I'm at. Yeah. And you know, Let, I've been more fun now than I ever have in this business. You, you brought up, you brought up parenthood. Yes. You brought up parenthood, like your son put things in perspective. Yes, for you guys. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. How many kids do you have? Got three kids. Okay. Got a thirty-one-year-old daughter who's an actuary out in New York. I got a twenty-five-year-old daughter who's up in Long Beach getting her PhD in psychology. Okay. And my son Jack, who's twenty-three, was up in Portland looking to be to go to law school to be an environmental lawyer, and called us this past January. Said, "Mom, Dad, I'm not quite sure I want to be a lawyer. I think I want to be an animal handler." Okay. So the zoo has been Jack's happy place his entire life. Nice. So we're like, duh. I mean, he's worked at the zoo, worked at the Wadamal Park. Uh, he was, he, he drove the bus at the zoo, which scared the shit out of me. I mean, he's sitting there. Jack's a great kid. Yeah. Driving has something to be a little, little, and they have him in this huge bus with 150 passengers back there where he's got to sit there and drive around the zoo. We have, we have people like, Oh, look, look at the cool giraffe and walking in front. And he's got to do his little patter. He's got to talk about what he's seen right. and tell everybody, welcome to the world famous San Diego zoo. I'm Jack, your bus driver <sighs> as I take you through the five continents. So, uh, so he's now back home. We had not 29 years with a kid in the house, nine months without anybody in the house and Jack's back, but he's in a great spot and looking to get his, his master's in entomology. So three great kids. And I'll give my wife Kelly of 31 years, all the credit. 31 years. 31 years. That will be a different podcast episode with Kelly, which oh. is like, how do you make that work? Like talking about being a coach right there. Oh, you're a coach. Oh, God. Yeah. I mean, she <laughs> made the accomplishment coach. ever. You made it. 31 yeah. Years. yeah. I mean, with, put up with my bullshit, of course. And again, I traveled nonstop. It was interesting. Right. Just a couple of Christmases ago, somebody was asking, asking me, you know, or asking Kelly, you know, how does she do what she does with, you know, being, she's a high school teacher, 
you know, raising kids. Yeah. And again, me traveling all the time. Right. And somebody else answered the question. They have talked to you and said, hey, have you ever talked to GA about what he does? He's super passionate about what he does. He loves what he does. And he truly believes he can make a big impact in people's lives. I can't take that away from him. And so my wife has supported me again. She's a saint. She has been there. We used to practice when things were so shitty. You know, I spent we, 31 years. The first five years sucked. Yeah. I kept losing job after job after job. And so we'd actually sit there and practice. Okay, Kelly, let's practice right now. <laughs> remember when? We'd kind of practice laughing about remember when, because we knew someday we'd be able to do that. So we, my wife had bought me a bottle of Dom, Perignon, to, for that. She said, put this away, and we're going to celebrate when we think we've actually made it. And so we bought it, bought this big fancy house in, in Rancho Santa Fe and had a library, had these beautiful leather chairs. And we just moved in and I'm sitting in the chair and my wife says, I'll be right back. And she went out and got, I'm going to get a little teary eyed over this. Got the bottle of Dom Perignon and we sat there and we were able to toast and say, hey, honey, remember when, you know, 13 years ago when things were so bad, we made it now and able to toast to that. I, I, I got chills. Yeah, so that's I got chills. Yeah, it's just about again what you know, kind of what able enables to do this is just really having a strong vision of what success looks like. Yeah, and being able to you know every New Year's is my birthday. I'm born first baby born in Orange County, 1965, and so every New Year's Day we sit down and kind of write our vision, of what success looks like. You know, I have I have four: one for me, just my personal relationship with myself; one for my relationship with my wife my relationship with my kids and my business. And I have my own personal coach, Rand Pip, who's amazing. I meet with him every Saturday for two hours from eight to 10 and working on being the best version of GA. So he's, I call him my spiritual advisor, if you would, but just really working on, you know, creating that right vision. And then, you know, throughout the year, I make, I make little incremental changes to it that we need to. And then our big thing was on Christmas Eve, we put the kids' presents out. And then we open a nice bottle of wine and we pull out our, our vision and see how did we do this here? Sometimes we crush it, sometimes we got close, sometimes we didn't. And that's okay too. Can you do it together? Yeah. Yeah. That's so freaking cool. Yeah. And my wife's a science teacher. So some of the woo of GA, she's like, I don't know about the woo, but hey, it's got notes to where we are. So <laughs> I got I got no I got no complaints. I'm not gonna doubt it. But I think it's important to have a strong vision. So what that allowed me to do, if I knew where I wanted to go. I could break it down to what do my values need to be? Right. What do my goals need to be? Kind of a vision is kind of a six foot ladder. The top rung is that top rung of the ladder. You can't step from the bottom to the top in one step. Yeah. So the rungs are your goals. I can figure out what do my goals need to be? Either monthly or quarterly. Then I can figure out what habits do I need to create? And then I, from the habits, I need to know what activities. So what, what having a strong vision for me has done is allowed me to do some unpleasant activities. Outbound cold calling. I freaking hate that. 137 things I'd rather do than make an outbound cold call. Why do I have that list? Because when I'm supposed to make an outbound cold calls, I've come up with a list of why would I rather be doing. But I can do outbound cold calls because it's an unpleasant activity that will lead to pleasant results. I've made a shit ton of money on cold calls. I mean, it's a lost art. And it still can be affected. It's harder today than ever before. Yeah. But again, people are doing it right. You know, it's funny that you call, uh, talk about cold calling, and this is what I've learned about cold calling. So I started a, a team uh, with a partner last year. I learned a lot. It didn't work out at all. It mm -hmm. went it went wrong, and I, I learned a lot about myself. And I'm glad that I went through the experience. What did you learn? The biggest learning that I had was that without, like, no matter how skillful I am as a sales professional, without putting it into a sales process that that – um, you're demonstrating to the right people yep. on your sales train. Yes. Friends are not a good option, no matter how much you love people. Like being a sales professional requires for you to be very comfortable being uncomfortable because there's going to be a lot of nuances that you haven't dealt with before. You just got to push through it, you Makes know? Sense. And then yeah. the other part of it is I learned, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the reason how come successful people make the money that they do is because they bring a differentiated value and they worked extremely hard on the skill set to 
convey that value and help you get to your solution as quickly as possible and the most efficient path possible. And if you're not willing to pay that, then someone else will. 100%. Yeah. No, that's... Can you see how much time I spent yeah. thinking about... Yeah. It, it's yeah. been... I, and, and GA, like, had I known there was someone like you, I would have gotten there quicker because all of this was me reading yeah. and or, coming or, up and formulating it myself. Yeah, and that's, I mean, almost all of our processes, we have this amazing delegation process. Right. And it came up because a lot of times I would delegate, I would land, I'd be in, in the airport running from terminal to terminal to my next flight. And I'd call my admin and say, hey, I need you to do this, 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 and this. All right, I'll see you later. And when it doesn't wasn't done the way I wanted, I would get pissed off. And so my team came up with this amazing delegation process. Okay. Step number one is, hey, here's what I need. We're all good at that. Here's, here's what I need. Number yeah. two is, here's when I need it. Right. But a lot of times, as the delegator, we don't tell people when we need it. And if we don't, then the delegatee comes up with two times. Either right now, let me stop what I'm doing, or whenever I get to it. And neither are correct. Would you agree? I would. 100% so, so step number agree. three is, hey, here's the resources that you could use to get this done. A lot of times people don't know the resources that they have available to them. So you as a delegator got to let them know. Then make it safe. Number four is, do you have any questions? What questions do you have about mm. this project? Make it safe for them to ask questions. Number five's got two parts to it. It's really important. Number, number one is, how long do you think this will take? So here's what happened. I, I, graphic design. I know nothing about graphic design. So I tell my graphic designer, I'm looking for this, for this job aid or for this manual. And he said, great. And I'm in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, that'd probably take him two, maybe three hours. So three hours later, I'm like, hey, where are we at with this? And they're like, what are you talking about, G? I need another three or four more hours. I'm like, oh, holy crap. It could take you six hours? Well, had I asked up front, hey, how long do you think this will take? It's going to take six hours. What, it could have changed my expectation. But here's what happens, though. If I don't have that, put that out there, I'm not frustrated because I don't have it in three He's not frustrated because he thinks he's supposed to already have it and he's still got a lot more work to do. So we can negotiate how much long, how long it should take. So I'm going to say, you know what, take four hours and, and, and stop right there because I think the enemy of, or the greatest enemy of done. People try to make things so perfect. Let's get it done. So, you know, how many things will take? And then also, what other projects are you working on? Right. Now, I'm the president of the company, if I go tell somebody to do something, most times they'll stop what they're doing. And this happened. I was talking to our designer. He's working on some manuals for me. And Stacy came barging into my office like, Stacy or GA, why is Alonzo working on your manual? I have a proposal due tomorrow. I'm like, oh, I know he's working on your proposal. I didn't ask. So what else are you working on? So that way I help people prioritize what they're doing. Then the next next step of it is, is let me know, or can I let me know when it's done. Close the loop. And if you're going to be late, let people know early. Don't take away my options. So if you're going to, if you're not going to get the document at time, don't tell them. At, you said you have it at four o'clock. Don't tell them at four o seven. I need a little bit more time. Tell them at two o'clock. Don't take away their options. That can I count on you? So those are that's how process driven we get. But almost all the processes I've come up with have all been through stuff that I failed at, and I've found <laughs> that failing oftentimes teaches much more lessons. And sometimes I'm still looking for some of these lessons. Yeah. Of things I failed at, but it's really taking a look at what are you doing? What can you get better at? And then how can you put a process around it? So what's really cool with this delegation process is everybody in my organization knows it. And we have what we call the reverse delegation, reverse delegation, you blow your mind right now. If I tell you, Hey, here's what I need. And I don't say what I need. You have to ask, Hey, when do you need to buy? What resources do you have available to me to get it done? Right. So everybody in my organization, it's their job to be reverse delegate if they don't get the information they need. Makes so it's not a, not an excuse. Oh, I didn't know. So, and uh, you bring up a, I think a phenomenal point, which is as I, I recognize this year, like I'm great at working in my business. I'm not very efficient at working on my business. I recognize that, and now I'm communicating, articulating, and I know I need to put this uh, process and systems in place. So I'm going and finding the people that are going to help me get there yeah. as quickly as possible because that's what it takes. Like there is no – GA, I, I've learned this. Having interviewed extremely successful people in life, there is no magic formula. Nope. There is no silver bullet. There nope. is none of that stuff. 
it requires the same exact things that have worked for hundreds of years. Yeah. And that's shocking. Yeah, no doubt. That's why, again, <laughs> when I, I started calling the book No Silver Bullet, because I didn't think right. there's any one thing. <laughs> but it, what we found the silver bullet is, it's the six steps that people did all the time. How do they pre-call plan so the best version of themselves shows up? How do they build rapport, start to reduce that resistance and increase that receptivity? How do they ask the right discovery questions where they're taking a genuine interest in the other person? How do they then present a benefit-rich tailored solution that's really tailored to what the person needs? Then we know that they're going to have concerns and objections. It's part of the way the, neuro, the brain works, and there's a lot of neuroscience in what we do, a right. lot. And so how do I address those concerns in a non-confrontational manner? Then how do I ask for the order? Or how do I mo close and motivate them to take the next step? So pre-call planning, build report, discovery, tailor solution, address concerns, close and motivate. Here's what's really interesting about this thing. Those are the six steps of my silver bullet process. Right. But what we found out, those six steps, pre-call plan, build report, discovery, tailor solution, address concerns, and close and motivate, are also the same six steps as a manager, as a coach, as a leader. How do you pre-call plan so the best version of yourself shows up? How do you build rapport with the person you're, you're coaching or managing? So it's, that, was, that was an aha moment one of my associates brought to me about four years ago. And that's really, again, a big part of what core, core leadership is all about is too, is the four core fundamentals, but then being able to take those six steps and apply to just about everything you do in coaching. You know, I, I think there's, uh, everyone talks about like sales, 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 all, all sales professionals care about is money. There's so much of like my sales professional career that I've applied to life, oh, God. you know, just people interaction. So I think all of us are salespeople in one fast or another. It, it's, it's the intention. Yeah. I think, well, behind. Concilio, we're not a sales company. Yeah. We're a communication company. There and you go. Our mission is to eradicate miscommunication. So you, what you think you want to say, you actually are able to articulate so that the person hears what you intend them to hear. And so, you know, our goal is a million people concilio certified. And again, we think if we focus on that, the rest of the stuff will take care of itself. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's interesting when you do the right things for the right reasons, how life tends it, to work it's, out it's, in your- It, it is, is amazing. Shocking. It really is. But here's the, the other piece is though, there is, there is no silver bullet, there is no shortcut. And I've, again, I've worked with all kinds of super successful and unsuccessful salespeople. Right. The biggest difference is work ethic. And the super successful people are willing to put the time, the energy, and the effort, again, to do some things that are uncomfortable to get pleasant results. And they're willing to do those things over time. They're willing to put the practice in. Practice, most people don't want to practice their communication skills. All right. Do they have the right, are they, do they document and have the right processes in place? Do they really practice their skill set and how do they ask questions? So it's about really it's putting in the work. And I don't, I, you know, that's why Jerry Rice was my favorite football player. Let's go because he put the work in. Yeah, you know, he talked to anybody. But it was interesting. I used to be told by a bunch of friends that I'm the hardest working person they know, and that's again that was part of that whole simplifying my life. I don't want to be. That's not the the icon I want to have. Right. I want to be. Hardworking, absolutely, but not the hardest working person they know. I got to be a little smarter than that. That's why I brought Stacy in to help me be my visionary. Well, we're going to have to definitely, you, you spoke so highly of Stacy. Oh, I say we, we finish off on that because one of my favorite parts of the podcast is who, who makes your life a little better, who makes the light. And you spoke about Kelly a lot. Yep. So talk about Stacy. Like, what, what is it about Stacy? that you appreciate because you have a lot of gratitude towards her. Oh, totally, absolutely. Uh, that she she has come into the organization and put her own fingerprint on it with her style. And she's a, an amazing communicator, uh, amazing person in creating the vision. And I realized that I'm not a visionary. I'm an execution guy. So again, oh. that's why I'm so process driven. That's why I need a process for everything. I mean, it's, my wife gets a little tired sometimes how process driven I am, yes. but that's, what's been able to help me be successful and, uh, and running a company execution is great, but do you have somebody who's able to, to be the visionary? And so right. she's an amazing facilitator. So we're going to be off in Cleveland next week, facilitating together and just love the opportunity. We just have a blast doing it, but she has really, I think, going to allow me to take my business to places it's never been before. So there's huge things coming for oh, a GA. 
There is. And Casilio. Yes. No, absolutely. And I love the name, by the way. That's, yeah. uh, I'm like, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, there's a lot of maneuverability yeah. with that. Well, it's, it's Latin for with intent or on purpose. With intent or on purpose. So how do you communicate with intent? How do you communicate on purpose? That's everything we're about is doing it with intent and on purpose. GA, I really enjoy your brand. Like, good for you, man. Like, I, it's, it's real. It's authentic. It's, and no doubt you're going to achieve great things. So when the book comes out in February, February ish. Yeah. Okay. Is that when you're coming back to talk about if you want me to be glad to, yes. Do you want to come back? But like, first off, I got to, I got I to shout out to my mom too, though. Cause my Let's mom's, go. Been, mom's been a big influence in my life too. Let's so. go. No, Give her she, a shout out. Oh, my, my mom is my biggest fan. The funniest part when we got the cover art for the book, core leadership, it's beautiful, but it's Stacy McKibben and GA Bartik. And my mom's first question, which should be the mother's first question is honey. How come your name's not first? Okay. And I said, well, mom, I already wrote a book. My name's first on this book. This is Stacy. It's, you know, it's kind of our, my process, my voice, along with all of her process too. She put the hard work in and I'm proud and happy to have her get top billing on this. But my mom is, if I'm on a tough day, I can give mom a call. She's 86 years old, plays pickleball, works out. She's a beast. Oh yeah. She'll outplank us both right now if we wanted to. Let's go. Uh, she's brilliant. And, and my, my biggest fan and a lot of success on the person I am today, you know, is created when you're a young kid. And my mom was, you know, a huge influence. And so was my father. But my mom has really continued to be that influence in my life, along with my wife and my kids. And now passing the baton on to help Stacy run my organization. There you go. GA, I mean, you know what? You got to give, you, I love the shout out to Mama Bartik. Yes. Like, you're like, I'm not leaving mom out. Like, no, yeah, come no, on. No. Mom, you're on a podcast. <laughs> yes. So thank you. Like, yeah. great job. And thanks, and mom. You still, what, what's her? What, what's the favorite meal that that she cooks for you? Like, mom was not a great cook. Mom was, oh. not, a great, mom was not a great cook. She knows that. <laughs> but her favorite, favorite meal, yes, she's a laugh. <laughs> is is a it's a chicken mushroom dish with the little onion stuff, the little okay. crispy crispy onions on top. It, yeah. It's almost lunchtime, so that's why yeah. I figured. Like little, yeah, it's got the little little noodles in it. Yes, so that was. Uh, oftentimes, when I go back home. Mom will still cook that, think, think, thinking that I still, that's my favorite dish still. Oh, so. got it. Just, we'll go with it. Exactly. We, she, we're not going to let her see the yeah, end of this. Exactly. We might have to edit that out. Yeah. So, G.A. Bartik, uh, silver, sell, uh, silver Bullet Selling, author, just an incredible, like, I, I just enjoy who you are. Ditto, my friend. Like, that That was that, that was, was just, incredible. Have fun and just appreciate somebody else who gets it. It's not about making the big dollars. That doesn't suck. I've been on both sides of that coin. I made a ton of money and I've also been super poor. Being a ton of money has its own issues too. It takes a lot of work, but God dang, does it allow you to do a lot of really cool, fun stuff. Yeah, there's more to come. I mean, I, like you said, the, the change begins when you take the first step and this is the first step to getting more, you know, more uh, people to understand there's a better way. It, sales doesn't need to just be all about the dollars. Nope. You can do both. I think you truly think you can. Just want to say, you know, thank you much for what you do each and every day, getting your message out there. Oh, absolutely. Hey, man, this is, uh, it's it's all of our communities. And instead of division, I, I, I rather preach uh, unity and working together. And let's go help other people. And it's about ROI, return on impact. Love that. So, GA, thank you so thank much. You much. Appreciate thank you, much, you man. everybody. Appreciate you all.